You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. This episode is supported by Code Comments, an original podcast from Red Hat. Be honest, do you comment your code? You know, when you're working on a project and you leave behind a small note in the code, a code comment, to help others learn what isn't clear in the code. Sometimes we leave comments for other people. Sometimes we leave comments for ourselves, a type of breadcrumbs. There's a lot of work required to bring a project from purchase to production, and the documentation doesn't always cover changing team dynamics. So the Code Comments podcast, which is hosted by Jamie Parker, he's a red hatter and an experienced engineer. In every episode, Jamie recounts the stories of experienced technologists from all across the industry who share what they've learned from implementing new technology. So if you're interested in real stories from real people going through real change, check out the Code Comments podcast. You can search for Code Comments in your podcast player, You can search for code comments in your podcast player. We'll also include a link in the show notes. My thanks to Code Comments for their support. The Gelsemium APT is active against a Southeast Asian government. A multi-year campaign against Tibetan, Uyghur, and Taiwanese targets... Stealth Falcon's new backdoor. Predator spyware is deployed against Apple Zero Days. An update on Pegasus spyware found in Medusa devices. There's a shift in Russian cyber espionage targeting. A rumor of cyber war in occupied Crimea. In our Industry Voices segment, Amit Sinha, CEO of Digicert, describes digital trust for the software supply chain. Our guest is Arctic Wolf's Ian McShane, with insights on the MGM and Caesars ransomware incidents. And if you're looking for a Super Bowl pick, go with an egg-laying animal. I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire Intel briefing for Monday, September 25th, 2023. We begin today with a quick overview of some recent activity that appears to be associated with Beijing. Palo Alto Networks Unit 42 is tracking an obscure threat actor, Gelsemium, that target a Southeast Asian government. The campaign featured a combination of rare tools and techniques that the threat actor leveraged to gain a clandestine foothold and collect intelligence from sensitive IIS servers belonging to a government entity in Southeast Asia. The researchers also note that Gelsemium isn't alone. Three separate clusters of cyber espionage activity have targeted different governmental entities in the same country, including critical infrastructure, public health care institutions, public financial administrators, and ministries. Each cluster appears to be the work of distinct threat actors. In another development, Veloxity describes long-running surveillance campaigns by the China-aligned Evil Bamboo threat actor against Tibetan, Uyghur, and Taiwanese individuals and organizations. The researchers note that these groups represent three of the five poisons designated by the Chinese Communist Party. The threat actor uses backdoored apps to target users of Android and iOS devices. Veloxity says... There are often supporting telegram groups used to share the latest version of any given application Evil Bamboo is pushing. Sometimes these groups are themed around a specific application, but on other occasions they're themed around a category of applications. While it may seem unusual to download apps from a source like this, it's not an uncommon practice, particularly where users may speak languages not commonly supported by the official versions of apps. ESET says the Stealth Falcon APT, which probably acts on behalf of the United Arab Emirates, is using a new and very sophisticated backdoor called Deadglyph to conduct espionage against government entities in the Middle East. Deadglyph has an unusual architecture, and its backdoor capabilities are provided by its CNC, 
in the form of additional modules. The researchers add, Notably, Dead Glyph boasts a range of counter-detection mechanisms, including continuous monitoring of system processes and the implementation of randomized network patterns. Furthermore, the backdoor is capable of uninstalling itself to minimize the likelihood of its detection in certain cases. Last week, researchers at Google and the University of Toronto's Citizen Lab discovered an actively exploited zero-day exploit chain for iPhones. The exploit chain was developed by commercial spyware vendor Intellixa and used by Intellixa's subsidiary Cytrox's spyware product Predator. Apple issued patches for the flaws on September 21st. According to Citizen Lab, Predator was used by the Egyptian government to target Egyptian presidential candidate Ahmed El Tentawi. Citizen Lab states, In August and September 2023, El Tentawi's Vodafone Egypt mobile connection was persistently selected for targeting via network injection when El Tentawi visited certain websites not using HTTPS a device installed at the border of Vodafone Egypt's network automatically redirected him to a malicious website to infect his phone with Cytrox's predator spyware. In another spyware incident, investigation into a Pegasus infestation at Medusa continues. The expatriot and dissident Russian news outlet now thinks that a European country and not Russia was responsible for the monitoring. Suspicion is now directed mostly toward a jittery Latvian security apparatus. Russia had been the obvious initial suspect, but that conclusion now seems premature at best and probably false. Yuri Suchihal, head of the State Service of Special Communications and Information Protection of Ukraine, said Friday in an interview with Reuters that his organization has seen a distinct shift in the targets selected by Russian cyber espionage services. At least two of the major intelligence units, the GRU and the FSB, had previously shown a distinct preference for collecting against Ukraine's electrical power infrastructure. They're now concentrating on Ukraine's law enforcement agencies, and specifically on those units charged with collecting and analyzing evidence of Russian war crimes. Sochiol told Reuters... There's been a change in direction from a focus on energy facilities toward law enforcement institutions, which had previously not been targeted that often. This shift toward the courts, prosecutors, and law enforcement units shows that hackers are gathering evidence about Russian war crimes in Ukraine. This may represent the early stages of an attempt to destroy evidence and otherwise interfere with investigations, but it's far more likely that it amounts to a form of opposition research— that the collection is being conducted with an eye to preparing disinformation campaigns that would be deployed to discredit otherwise credible allegations of war crimes. The activity is consistent with other recent incidents, including the compromise of systems at the International Criminal Court. Around the time a Ukrainian missile strike hit the Black Sea Fleet headquarters and occupied Sevastopol Friday, Russian sources in Crimea said that the conquered peninsula was under cyber attack. Oleg Kryakov, spokesman for the local occupation authorities, said in his Telegram channel, an unprecedented cyber attack on Crimean internet providers. We are detecting interruptions in the internet on the peninsula. All services are working to eliminate the threat. We apologize for the temporary difficulties. The Kyiv Independent wrote Friday that Ukrainian authorities had yet to comment, No further developments were reported over the weekend. There are rumors of Ukrainian hacktivist auxiliary action and some complaints by Russian occupation authorities, but this is still so far a rumor of cyber war. And finally, do you follow professional football? Did you know that the Super Bowl has a complex and dynamic attack surface? Turns out, it does. The National Football League and the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency held a tabletop exercise last week to explore, assess, and enhance cybersecurity response capabilities, plans, and procedures ahead of the Super Bowl. CISA stated, The Super Bowl cybersecurity tabletop exercise is the latest in a series of assessments and exercises designed to ensure the safety of events at Allegiant Stadium. This exercise brought together more than 100 partners from the NFL, Stadium, 
and federal, state, and local governments to review and discuss plans and procedures for protecting against, responding to, and recovering from a significant cyber attack during the nation's most-watched sporting event. The four-hour exercise also provided an opportunity for participants to identify the available resources, capabilities, and best practices of their governmental partners and strengthen their resilience. NFL Senior VP and CSO Kathy Lanier noted, At the NFL, we understand how important it is to practice like you play, and this week's exercise is the first of many simulations we will conduct prior to the Super Bowl. Our Super Bowl prediction is Ravens versus Eagles, with the Ravens prevailing, but then we always pick an ornithological final for professional sports championships. When there aren't two birds in the running, we'll at least go for an oviparous championship. In the World Series, for example, we're predicting an Orioles-Diamondbacks contest, egg-laying animals only, with the Orioles taking the championship in six. Yeah, yeah, we know, before we get objections from herpetologists, Diamondbacks carry their eggs internally, but still, eggs, close enough, place your bets. Coming up after the break, Amit Sinha, CEO of DigiCert, describes digital trust for the software supply chain. Our guest is Arctic Wolf's Ian McShane with insights on the MGM and Caesars ransomware incidents. Stay with us. And now, a word from our sponsor, Know Before. Where would InfoSec professionals be without users making security mistakes? Working less than 60 hours per week, maybe. Actually having a weekend every so often. While user behavior can be a challenge, they can also be an InfoSec professional's greatest asset once properly equipped. Users want to do the right thing, but often lack the knowledge to do so. That's one of the reasons KnowBefore developed Security Coach, a real-time security coaching tool that takes alerts from your existing security stack and sends immediate coaching to users who've taken risky actions. Existing security tools will likely block a user from visiting a high-risk website, for example, but the user might not understand why. Security Coach analyzes these alerts and provides users with relevant security tips via email or Slack, coaching them on why the action they just took was risky. Help users learn from their mistakes and strengthen your organization's security culture with Security Coach. Learn more at knowbefore.com slash security coach. That's knowbefore.com slash security coach. And we thank Know Before for sponsoring our show. Struggling to secure on-prem apps with modern identity? Don't worry, you're not alone. Join industry leaders from Fortune 500 organizations to secure your apps on any cloud with any IDP, regardless of your environment's complexity. Meet Strata's identity orchestration platform, Mavericks. Say goodbye to the headaches of app refactoring and legacy tech debt. With identity orchestration, you can modernize legacy apps to use MFA or passwordless authentication in a few weeks, migrate from one IDP to another, and so much more without changing the app. No matter your IAM use case, Strata extends the value of your current identity investments. And the best part? You can try it for free today. Visit strata.io slash cyberwire to share your biggest identity challenge, and they'll hook you up with a complimentary pair of AirPods Pro. Don't miss out. Visit strata.io slash cyberwire. That's strata.io slash cyberwire. The solar winds incident back in 2020 put a spotlight on the challenges of securing the software supply chain. Since then, a variety of solutions have been proposed along with products and platforms to strengthen and simplify the process. My guest today is Amit Sinha, CEO of DigiCert. 
In this sponsored Industry Voices segment, he shares his insights from being on the front lines of the battle for digital trust for the software supply chain. If you follow the news, uh, in January this year, GitHub reported that a whole bunch of encrypted code signing certificates were, were exfiltrated. Uh, well, fortunately, those certificates were password protected, so the, the effects were contained. But that was a that was a huge problem. If you look back earlier, you know you had issues with code signing keys being compromised at ASUS, at Intel, and even Microsoft. You know, in the case of ASUS, they you know they manufacture drivers, and uh, unfortunately, they put the code signing keys on web servers that were basically being used to download those drivers. Once those web servers were compromised, the signing keys were stolen and the hackers were able to then essentially sign uh, malware with those, uh, with those driver updates, right? And that was crazy. So now you have, uh, you know, malware infested drivers that are, you know, fundamental to your operating system in making sure that your devices are working properly. Intel was a similar problem. Right. Code signing keys for their boot guard system got leaked and uh, again led to potentially malicious firmware during the, the boot process. I think recently Mandiant has talked about how Microsoft's code signing keys were illicitly, illicitly obtained by, uh, by, again, threat actors and they used that to sign malware pretending to be Microsoft. Now, imagine how bad that is. You know, you get a piece of software on your PC and it says, yep, authentic, signed by Microsoft. It just lets uh, people uh, feel safe when uh, it's not. So the first problem here is that signing keys need to be protected. And uh, fortunately, in, uh, in, in June this year, standards bodies evolved and uh, uh, and now uh, it's uh, it's a basic requirement that you cannot issue code signing keys uh, without a hardware token. And what a hardware token or a HSM or uh, module does is it essentially makes sure that the private keys cannot be exfiltrated, copied, shared, etc. Right. So reduces the attack surface of the types of problems that we talked about. So that's a good evolution. So step one, you know, you do need to get uh, code signing keys. And for that, you need to establish yourself as a, as a software developer. And what companies like Digicert do, uh, being a root of trust on the internet, uh, as part of our code signing process, we validate the organization. We check your credentials. We make sure that you are legitimate and then offer you your code signing keys, which starting June this year has to be on a HSN. Now, more mature organizations will take it a step further. They'll say, well, not only do we need to protect our code signing keys, I need to do two other things. The second thing I need to do is I need to inspect my software development supply chain, right? I need to integrate uh, software trust in the entire CI/CD pipeline in the build process itself. And how do we do all this without creating undue friction for the developers themselves? You know, as I I, I know you've made the point that you know they just want to they want to write their code, they want to do their work, they don't want to be slowed down by these sorts of things. And can we protect against that? Yeah, absolutely. Look, uh, you know, the, there is a, a bit of a trade-off between security and ease of use. Uh, I'll share an example. I mean, we talk a lot about generative AI these days, and uh, you know, every CEO is out there saying, hey, what can we do with generative AI? And that puts pressure on the software development community uh, or their teams. And, uh, you know, they'll go and they'll download whatever packages are available without, you know, scanning them, without thinking about it. And that can lead to increased risk, right? There were, there have been discussions where, you know, some language models and some neural network frameworks were laced with malware and, uh, and nobody's really thinking about scanning them. So sometimes, you know, when there is a pressure to deliver things, people take shortcuts 
and uh, it, it becomes uh, an easy door uh, through which uh, threat actors can infiltrate your, your software development process. So back to your question, Alan, how do we make it easy? So, you know, you have secure software development without too much uh, friction in the process. It starts with, again, automation. If you look at uh, DigiCert's Software Trust uh, Manager solution, we automate and integrate into your CI CD pipeline, basically your development pipeline. And um, all the keys are managed in the cloud, in cloud secure HSMs. Once you set up your policies, automation kicks in, and you can say during you know, these uh, key build processes or these milestones automatically scan software, flag anything that looks bad. And uh, if everything is green, you know, generate a bill of materials and sign the software. So from a developer's perspective, it is it's smooth, it's automated. And uh, what you're shipping is this high quality software that uh, is... Uh, you know, is, is tamper resistant. And, uh, you know, it's almost like if you look at FDA stamping a piece of food as organic, right, with all the contents on it, it just gives a higher level of assurance. Now, does it take a little bit of extra work? Sure. But as a consumer, you feel better uh, because you can make informed choices. So same is true for software. I think uh, uh, if you have the right set of tools, uh, you can uh, generate high quality software, stamp your brand on it, and uh, your, your customers can uh, feel more assured that uh, uh, they, have, uh, you know, they have a good product for you. That's Amit Sinha from DigiCert. MGM Resorts and Caesars Entertainment in Las Vegas are both recent victims of high-profile breaches of their systems, with Caesars reportedly negotiating a ransom payment and MGM claiming to have most of their systems back online with a few fits and starts. Ian McShane is vice president of strategy at Arctic Wolf Networks, and I checked in with him for insights on these high-roller hacks. My brain instantly went to, oh, I wonder if that's ransomware, just like any other kind of incident. There's a similar thing happened a few weeks ago when I was flying from, from London to the US and the air traffic control system in the UK went down. And the first thing that came to my mind is, oh, I wonder if that's ransomware. And it seems like that's, that's where a lot of people's brains go to when they see organizations, certainly high profile organizations, having some kind of technical difficulties. And that seems to have played out here, right? I mean, at least the even if we're only at the point of informed speculation, and I suppose Caesars has filed an 8K, I mean, ransomware seems to be where we've landed? It seems, it seems like, and yeah, you're right, like, there's a lot of this is just speculation or, or at least um, educated guesswork on behalf of people that have been in and around the incident itself. But yeah, it uh, certainly seems like it was a ransom type event. I don't know whether that ransomware was actually deployed to anything. There's been talk of, you know, some uh, infrastructure being infected with something, but I don't know that there's actually been Um, confirmed, certainly not for MGM anyway. I think part of what's been surprising people is at least the perception with organizations like this, you know, big casinos uh, who are handling millions of dollars a day that they would have the resources to have better security than perhaps what we're seeing here. Is that a fair assessment? It's it's important to to think about what really happens here. And, you know, ultimately it sounds like what it is is, is some kind of phishing or, or vishing, which is an awful portmanteau of voice phishing, I suppose. And so these kind of social engineering incidents can really happen to, to any organization. It's less about technical controls and more about people and process. Now, that's not to say that um, people are necessarily to blame. It's, it's hard to point fingers and say they could have invested more or they didn't invest enough when we don't really know the entire story. And again, it's important to understand that anyone, any organization or any human being, for that matter, could be caught out by this type of scam. Just think about the amount of people that are, you know, conned into giving away or transferring money away on a, on a daily basis, which again is another kind of social engineering uh, attack. I suppose it's a reminder that if this can happen to a, a well-funded organizations like these, that it could happen to anyone. 
Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's, again, it's a reminder that technology isn't the be all and end all in cybersecurity. There's a lot to be said for the, the human process, the human factor in both the defensive side and on the, the receiving end of the um, attack itself. You know, it almost sounds similar to the, the incident with, with Uber uh, last year as well, which used in a, another type of social engineering, but this time through technology, right? To, to gain access. And ultimately, that one caused a lot of panic across the industry around the use of multi factor authentication and how the app alerts can really be used to annoy someone into to doing something they normally wouldn't do. What do you suppose is going on at this moment when it comes to incident response? Well, it's been, it's been a, a, a week, maybe a little bit longer, 10 days, I guess, as we're recording this. So at this point, I would have expected a company of that size to have a pretty well-defined uh, disaster recovery plan, you know, assuming they have contingency plans for when power goes out or when their, their systems go down through a, you know, not through a threat actor incident, but through some other kind of um, problem. I would imagine that they've got well-rehearsed plans to bring things up, as, up and running as fast as possible, certainly for their critical uh, infrastructure. So at this point, I would imagine that there's probably some law enforcement engagement going on to help understand what happened, how it happened, and whether or not there's an avenue for law enforcement to help with, as well as you know the internal post-mortem of figuring out how do we get everything back to a good state and how do we prevent this from happening again in the future. You know, it's it's easy to to throw rocks, you know, from the outside and, <laughs> and be critical here. But one of the things that struck me with this incident was the the breadth of systems that have been affected here. I mean, sp- speaking specifically with MGM, you know, we hear slot machines have gone down, um, uh, reservation systems, uh, there's reports of um, hotel doors not being accessible and so on. As we read the tea leaves on that, is it is it likely that the, the bad actors were able to get in and then make lateral movement or were maybe more of these systems hosed together in a common way than perhaps was wise? It's, it's very difficult to say. And of course, you know, Monday night quarterbacking is, is very easy for people like us to sit here and do, and, and, and largely unfair, really. Right. But there's, there's a couple of things. That, you know, it could be that they had a, you know, a, a flatter network topology than they could have. So just one um, successful intrusion meant the, the actor could move laterally to anything. It could be it could go way more deeper than that. Maybe, you know, the, the, the adversaries were specifically attacking a user account or user credentials that had, you know, explicit permissions across multiple systems. Or maybe they hopped between accounts. Maybe that, you know, the chain of attack is, is more complex than, you know, air quotes, just a, a phishing attack. There's so much unknown about what happened here. And the impact, like you said, is so broad that it makes this a really interesting interesting incident and i mean that in the best possible way possible and you know i don't mean to be detrimental to the people that are suffering through the incident response process themselves right what are some of the lessons you think that we can take away from this well again it comes down to it's not just technology you know, if, this, if this truly was as widely reported if this truly was uh, a threat actor calling up the help desk and, and walking through some kind of uh, remediation workflow to get access to an account it's one of those things where you have to think about how do you authenticate the person on the other end of the phone? How do you guarantee that, you know, Ian calling the Arctic Wolf help desk is really Ian asking for his account credentials to be reset. It's similar in, in a way to how we talk about um, business email compromise, right? Which is that, that scam where someone manages to convince from an internal email account, convince someone with the authority to transfer money to send a large sum of cash to a bank account outside of normal process. And so, you know, I think, there's something to be said for security awareness, helping people understand what are the risks, but also, you know, going through the post process and procedure and making sure you're giving your employees that are tasked with this type of help desk work where you're, you know, resetting credentials or, or providing locked out account holders with access to their accounts, that you're able to that they're able to actually authenticate the people correctly and not just, oh yeah, this is your name, this is your email address, I'll just get that sent over to you straight away. That's Ian McShane from Arctic Wolf Networks. Bluestone Analytics, a CACI company, is the established leader in dark web exploitation and analysis. Their powerful yet easy-to-use dark blue intelligence suite 
has revolutionized how analysts uncover information in the open, the deep, and the dark web. With an easy integration between data exploration and collection, Bluestone's tools will help you discover, pursue, and engage without revealing your identity to adversaries. Learn why analysts trust Bluestone Analytics to reveal hidden data at www.bluestoneanalytics.com. Shed some light on the deep, dark web. That's bluestoneanalytics.com. And that's the Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. Don't forget to check out the Grumpy Old Geeks podcast, where I contribute to a regular segment with Jason and Brian on their show. For a lively discussion of the latest news every week, you can find Grumpy Old Geeks where all the fine podcasts are listed. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at cyberwire at n2k.com. Your feedback helps us ensure we're delivering the information and insights that help keep you a step ahead in the rapidly changing world of cybersecurity. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like The Cyberwire are part of the daily intelligence routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, as well as the critical security teams supporting the Fortune 500 and many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Liz Irvin and senior producer Jennifer Ivan. Our mixer is Trey Hester with original music by Elliot Peltzman. The show was written by our editorial staff. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. What's the true cost of a single cybersecurity incident? Try $4.3 million, and it's even higher in the United States. Each organization faces more than 1,200 cyber attacks per year. Tally that up and you're staring down some hefty losses. Getting ahead of these threats requires the right technology for tying cyber risk to business impact, so you can add context to any risk decision, prioritize remediation, and report what matters most to your key stakeholders. LogicGate's Risk Cloud Cyber Risk and Controls Compliance Solution makes all of that possible. Learn more at LogicGate.com. One final note, if you missed our recent panel discussion with my friends at Unit 42 by Palo Alto Networks and Dragos on securing industrial infrastructure, you can catch the conversation on demand by visiting thecyberwire.com slash Dragos.